Frankfurt American Alumni Radio. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, Frankfurt Millcom and U.S. Millcom family. My name is Otis Cupate here on the Frankfurt American Alumni Radio Show, and it's been quite some time since uh, I touched base with you in this format, at least. You know, still been uploading videos along with Lynn, who is also here with me. Would you like to say hello, Lynn? Hello, everybody. Here in September 2017, we decided to get together and do a radio show once again from the Frankfurt American Alumni Radio because, well, number one, we love doing radio shows because we can get a lot of information out to you. We can share a bit more tidbits with you uh, through this format rather than making a video because right. yeah because videos are so much more time consuming and uh, if you've heard us share information about how videos are done by us in the past you know that many of the videos take over 40 to 50 hours easily to prepare so the thing that occurred very recently over here here in Frankfurt Germany on September 3rd 2017 was a very disturbing topic having to do with a bomb that was found on the former military's compound, the Abrams building compound. There was a bomb that was discovered there, a four ton bomb. And again, that was uh, just recently here in September, 2017. Now, for those of you who have been around, uh, stopping by and, you know, checking out shows and things like that over the years, which uh, I think has been, what, about four years and seven months. That yeah, we, four and a half years, about. Yeah, that we've uh, been putting up radio shows and sharing videos with the U.S. military family around the world. It used to be here in Germany. And I guess most specifically here in Frankfurt, the thing that you would have seen if you went on the channel is the video that we uploaded about the Frankfurt, Germany bomb removal day. Yeah, that was really something because the whole city was closed down. And that's amazing. Yeah, it was a enormous operation that was successfully undertaken by the officials and uh, emergency helpers, including police and other people who were, I guess, deputized, <laughs> if you will, to try to get 65,000 people out of their homes, out of clinics, out of hospitals, out of the whole one mile and some odd surrounding area from the old former Abrams building compound there was a whole radius of one mile and perhaps a little more where people had to be removed it seemed like the radius was more than that though because it went all the way into the city mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it seemed like it was at least two or three miles radius yeah to me yeah it did to me if I may say seem like it they were being a little bit extra 
you know, they were being a little bit overcautious, if that's at all possible. I don't know if it's possible to be too safe, Lynn. But uh, I think one can overdo it. Yeah, it, it's it's like Barney Fife used to overdo it on the Andy Griffin show. Or like the guy we saw on the straws who braced himself from the straws uh, yeah. stopping. Yeah. It was over the top. Yeah, he was acting like there was like a, 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 a 8.0 earthquake going on uh, when he was bracing himself. He was looking like he was, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it, was so, it was so over the top. We remember it years later. I don't know. Again, I still am a bit stuck on can you be too safe because if this bomb went off, it could have, you know, not only flattened a block or two, and the German block, by the way, is much bigger it's right. than a American, American block. American block. Yeah. I mean, on that note too, Lynn, you know, something that I was thinking about is that since this artillery, this munition was on the compound, the former Abrams Building compound, since 1944 to 1945, all the way up until 2017, which is about, what, 72 years, right? About 72 years. Yeah. There may have been other unexploded uh, munitions on the compound that could have been triggered if this bomb was ever disturbed to the extreme that it exploded. You know what I'm saying? It, it could have like set off a chain reaction yeah, is that if, what you mean if there were other unexploded munitions under the ground that went unremoved that went right. undiscovered like this four ton blockbuster bomb did so maybe that's what they also suspected and why they kept people at a super duper duper distance and closed down i would say one fourth of the city of frankfurt germany oh i would say even more it seemed like it was more we didn't go around the whole city, but I think the perimeters was larger than that. I think it was all the way down, like by the train station mm -hmm. and and in the Ginheim area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we just didn't take. A, we just stayed in a certain section of the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to reiterate that that was on September third, twenty seventeen. That this unexploded four ton blockbuster bomb was removed safely from the premises. I'm still very much bothered by the whole situation. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I asked Lynn to join me in doing a show because the main thing that bothered me so much, Lynn, as you know, but I have to tell those who are interested, <laughs> <laughs> the thing that bothered me so much about it is that I was up on that compound for so many years uh, and in in so many intervals for so many different reasons and knowing that that bomb was there and it could have killed me and my friends and other people, other U.S. Milcom members, etc. Right. That really is annoying, especially when there's supposed to be inspectors and uh, investigators and equipment being used to remove all that type of stuff bec before construction takes place. Well, you know, I understand. But when I think about it, because we did little research and we realized that this was not the first time that a bomb was found in Germany and had to be detonated. That's right. That's right. But and actually one time a bomb did go off. And I think people were injured and killed when it was trying to be undet when they were trying to undetonate it. But I have never heard of a bomb from World War II exploding underground or when it's been found when nobody's been trying to mess with it. I've never heard of bombs just exploding. Right. You know what I mean. So this bomb, if it wasn't found this time. I kind of feel like it would be there another 50 years and, and never explode because mm -hmm. it's in dirt. It has nothing to, I don't think it has anything that would set it off, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's very, very interesting. And I remember that you had uh, alluded to something about that on the day that we were collecting video footage for the fam. 
I remember you talking about that. Um, well, it seems to be a fact because mm -hmm. I too haven't heard of a bomb that's exploded mm -hmm. that was not tampered with. For example, someone didn't accidentally step on the area. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I just wanted to add, sorry, I just wanted to add, I think what could cause it to explode would be an earthquake, but we don't have earthquakes here in Germany. Very rarely do we have any kind of earthquake. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would set one off, you know. Yeah, well, according to reports, the bomb and most bombs that are dropped, they submerge themselves into the earth from a distance between... 10 and 22 feet and i would imagine since this particular blockbuster bomb was four tons four tons that is actually eight thousand pounds because one ton is two thousand pounds right right okay so that's eight thousand pounds so i would imagine that this bomb submerged itself embedded itself at least 22 feet underneath the ground right yeah and i would think at the same time even though it did that it moved it displaced a lot of dirt and or concrete and or asphalt whatever was at that location when the bomb was dropped it displaced all of that further leaving it more seeable more visible to the naked eye or hopefully to inspectors that were going to check the area out before construction began at that location you know before the ambassador arms was built before the frankfurt american high school was built in 1946 is when we took it over i think the building was built in 1935 36 itself something like that you know I, before the abrams building was uh turned over to the americans which was formerly what was it the ig farben building right ig farben i would think though I can understand what you're saying, but I would also, and I think I mentioned this before to you, I would also think with enough height and enough impact that in the bomb weighs, what, what did we just say, 4,000 tons? Four tons. Which uh, was, uh, 4, 000, 4 tons, which is 8,000 pounds. Correct. With that kind of weight, I think it could fall with such an impact that the dirt would explode up in the air and then fall over the bomb do you know what i mean i think that's possible i can imagine that i could imagine it your way but i could i see it more my way because why would they not remove something like that if they saw it perhaps it had to do with the uh the theory that you you shared that maybe because it dropped and it didn't explode that it was best to leave the bomb alone because it was much more reasonable to do so rather than try to remove it because of it, you know, it could explode. Maybe they didn't have the manpower. Maybe they didn't even have the actual technology that they do now, right? That they should have had to safely be able to remove it. In other words, to be able to say, by us removing this bomb, you know, the officials saying this, by us removing this bomb, what is the likelihood of success or failure? And so they may have thought that, well, it's best to leave it there because the rate of us failing is much more higher than the, re the rate of us, you know, succeeding. Right. But they didn't leave it there now. So something must have changed then in the technology. Mm. Because they didn't leave it there now when they found it. They didn't try to build around it or... Or do it they only found it because they're building something there that's why they found it yeah well they're they're rebuilding something there that whole area was built up yeah well they're but, building something new there right and that's how it was found from a a, a a bulldozer moving earth and them making holes and stuff preparing the ground for a new construction so if technology hasn't changed they would have just left it like if our theory is correct then they would you would think they would just leave it mm -hmm. in the ground like they did years ago if they knew it was there and left it in the ground. But since technology must have changed as far as um, undetonating a bomb. Right. Or, yeah. Defusing. Defusing a bomb. Then that's why they did it, you know. Yeah.
Well, again, um, these are hypotheses. We're, we're guessing. Right. Uh, and on that note, I would like to ask you, since you are very fluent in German, did you come across any articles in the German mainstream um, news that alluded to or was explicit about why the bomb might have been you know, not removed purposely perhaps or mm -mm. how it could have been missed by inspectors, professional inspectors with the instruments, the technology that we're assuming, that we're surmising that they had. No. You had come across nothing. Nobody, t nobody even talked about that aspect of the bomb. Right. They talked about the bomb itself, how, what it was made of, the intended purpose of it back then, but nobody talked about, not that I heard of anywhere or read anywhere, because um, I listened extensively to the radio, they talked about it. And um, no, nobody talked about how, why it would be left there or, or why it wasn't found back then when they were building. No, they don't touch on that at all. Even in articles I've read, they, they don't touch on that. Mm -hmm. Well, is there any reason that you could think of from knowing the German culture very well, even more than me? And just by the way, I say that even with the knowledge that I have of being over here in Germany off and on for 40 years. For those of you who don't know me, Otis Pate, um, I've been here in Germany off and on since 1977. I first came over to Germany uh, in June 1977 with my parents and back then my stepfather uh, a man by the name of MacArthur Walker yeah, there is a, a soldier name for you MacArthur Walker was in the military he was enlisted and we got stationed over here from Fort McCullen Alabama so from that point of 1977 up to here in 2017, I, for the most part, have lived here in Germany for, except for a couple of years where I've been in the States, uh, three or four years. And also I've lived in London for about three years, um, uh, et cetera. But Lynn, you've been over here uh, at least that long and your roots and your understanding of the culture, I think is better because your mom is German, right? Right. So, that's why I'm, I'm wondering, when I ask this question, from your perspective, what is the reason you would think that the mainstream media might not be touching on that topic? Because I think to most adults, most people who are paying attention to the situation, to the headlines, and just thinking about it, it's like how in the world could a bomb that's 8,000 pounds go, you know, undiscovered? I really couldn't answer that. I really, I really couldn't answer that. Um, I actually myself have never really thought about it until you mentioned it. Only because it's like, oh well, we're in Germany. Okay, yeah, there's still lots of World War II bombs around, but I never thought of why are they still around. I just, I just always figured, okay, they dropped in the ground and then you couldn't see them no more kind of with the theory I mentioned a few minutes ago. But no, I don't know why anybody doesn't touch on it. Maybe they figure, um, maybe they don't want to talk about it because maybe the reason why is something that would irritate and anger the public, you know? I mean, why would they want to say, oh, well, the government knew about it, but they didn't do nothing because they didn't want to spend the money or... Why would they want to say that kind of stuff now? That would just irritate the the public. And it's also an election year. So, <laughs> I mean, elections are next week. So who knows how that might uh, somehow influence voting, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe it has something to do with that. Right. That is a supporting situation that has to do with why there were so many cops thousands of cops in vans all over frankfurt block, blocking off streets redirecting traffic uh closing down parks there were also tanks and they had a uh, different type of truck tanks it was almost like they were preparing for some type of riot but um you mm -hmm. know but none of that type of stuff took place it's like that person who who uh 
wrote us on YouTube, you know, how many times have we actually walked over that bomb <laughs> wow. and had no idea, you know? Wow. Or just a few feet away yeah. from it or if it was like in a building that we did, didn't go in, like the JAG office, for instance, um, we we still walk close to it, you know? Yes, I know I know that I did hundreds of I times. I went to the Abrams building. I went to the bowling alley. I went, you know, in that whole area, I was there. Yeah, yeah. It's, and you too. Yeah, it's, it's very serious. And Lynn mentioned the video that we put up. The person who left a comment was was leaving or had left this comment underneath the video again that we posted about the bomb removal day here in frankfurt germany your european home away from home <laughs> <laughs> yeah on september 3rd 2017 so that was just about a week and a half ago and uh made a quick video put it together as good as we could and uh, shared that with you um, but I think uh, we should just let that marinate for a moment because I think we laid a bit of the whole foundation I wanted to say something else I wanted to say, <laughs> I were looking to, at me like you were waiting for me to say the word yeah I thought you were gonna say buffet oh <laughs> and uh, yeah now that we've laid out the whole buffet <laughs> okay <laughs> let's just go to uh, a little uh, vibe session a little bit of music here and and then come back with some information that we wanted to share because we compile some information some questions that we'd like to pose to you to get your opinions in the comments section and uh, you know and perhaps it also will be some food for thought well again my name is Otis Cupate and I'm here with my wife Lynn and um, we'll be right back after this vibe session, indeed. Bis bald. Frankfurt American Alumni Radio here in September on the 15th, 2017.
broadcasting to you, sharing this food for thought from Frankfurt Sachsenhausen, the old part of Sachsenhausen, for those of you who are, you know, wondering where in the world we're located. We are located in old Sachsenhausen. Well, right on the little outskirts of the main part of the town that's considered old Sachsenhausen. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? We're not directly in old Sachsenhausen, but we're like five minutes away from it. Yeah, a five-minute walk. Here on, this, uh, here on uh, the day that, um, well, that is uh, reminding me of September 3rd, when uh, this tremendous size unexploded bomb was being removed from the former Abrams Building compound. And also that was, of course, the compound that housed the very popular and longtime standing Frankfurt American High School. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if uh, it wasn't mentioned before, my wife and I, we both graduated in 1985 from the school. Um, and coming away from an atmosphere like that and traveling off into life, you know, so to speak, was very, it was very much a benefit for me because being around so many different cultures, but seeing all of us get along and, you know, have, a, and having the Eagle spirit, that was our, our, I guess it's called mascot. Uh, Frankfurt American High School's mascot or yeah. our <laughs> our image was, was the mascot, eagle. Yeah. Is it mascot? Was the eagle just like the eagle is for the United States? So I always thought that was really appropriate too. Here with this topic, this is a retroactive look back at being a military family member in Germany, and this is episode one. And this information that we're going to share with you, of course, we would like to get your opinions on things on these topics in the comment section. I want to say that this was from June 1977 through June 2006. So uh, 29 years where this information applies, as well as this information is for Germany, inside Germany, uh, Milcom, military community and that's what MILCOM stands for, for short, military communities in Germany. Like, number one, and this is a bit of an introductory, recently, as you know, on September 3rd, 2017, at the old Abrams Building Concern, about 150 meters from the Frankfurt American High School, a live four-ton World War II bomb, known as a blockbuster, was found. It was reported um, by the German mainstream media during weeks of August 2017 and the first week of September 2017 that the bomb had been dropped by the British Army in 1944 or 1945, which of course is about 72 years ago. Wow. <laughs> this unexploded blockbuster bomb had also been at its recently found location during the whole time that the U.S. military Abrams Building Concern and the Frankfurt American High School were in operation over a period of about 50 years. And that period is from 1946 up until 1995. So that in itself was about 50 years, yeah. And that's when the Abrams Building and the Concern deactivated they deactivated in 1995 the school and the abrams building so our question here is how could this bomb not be noticed upon inspection of the property by officials there would have been easily seeable evidence easily seeable evidence of the four ton eight thousand pound bomb especially since the bomb had not exploded like you know this bomb didn't explode also there would have been a huge crater Lynn and moreover there would have been and should have been a trained military force with the knowledge of detecting unexploded artillery again how could this enormous bomb be overlooked and missed 
upon the mandatory inspection of the knowingly bombed property. Lynn, you have any response on that? Well, I go back. The only hypothesis I have is what I had mentioned um, a few minutes ago about the bomb being so heavy and being dropped from such a high, from such a height that it would bury itself in the ground and be covered by dirt. Now, why it wouldn't be fi- Now, why it wouldn't be found um, before they start building on that ground? For me, just shows either a lack of technology or a lack of money in inspecting inspecting the property, the ground before building on it. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds very probable. And uh, of course, we would like to get your thoughts on that issue. How could the enormous bomb be overlooked and miss upon the mandatory inspection of the knowingly bombed property? Because this property had this property had been most certainly bombed, and there's been other artillery that's been found there. This wasn't the first, or maybe it's munition. Uh, that was found there. This wasn't the first. The most recent bomb that was removed on September 3rd, 2017, wasn't the first. Right. Yeah, if you look this up on the internet and check the links that we're going to have available for you, you will see this. So, thank you for that, Lynn. On the number two, now, this is the housing areas, and please keep in mind, this is what we call episode one, and it's about false security. The false security that we had, even though around us was a much different reality. Number two, housing areas. In Frankfurt and many other locations around Germany were mostly without an entrance and exit security force. Most of the entrances and exits in housing areas in Frankfurt and in many other parts, because I've, I've been to many other parts of Germany in housing areas and they mostly were without an entrance and exit security force. So that meant that means in other words, when you enter, you weren't checked, you weren't ID'd, your car wasn't checked for explosives or whatever. And when you exited, there was no check. And yes, there has been times back in those days when there were bomb alerts and things of that nature where you were checked definitely coming in and randomly upon leaving. So Lynn, any thoughts on why do you think there was no security force at those at those locations? The only thing I can think of for that is that the military, the soldiers and the the higher ups in the military chain of command thought that because we are doing good that we are for the good and that we are helping Germans and the German country the country of Germany that nobody would want to hurt us that's the only thing I can think of because where I lived in Darmstadt and Lincoln Village there was no check for coming or going mm-hmm and by the way, on that note... In the I'm, housing area. Right. Yeah. Right. I just wanted to add on that note, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that you lived in Darmstadt, which is about 30 minutes south of Frankfurt. Right. And Lynn, of course, as I mentioned earlier, was a student at Frankfurt American High School, though, even though she went to Darmstadt. Many outlining areas over the years from 1946 up into the closing in 1995, many areas... Uh, dependent students were students of Frankfurt American High School. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you mentioned Darmstadt. So uh, thank you for that. Number three, housing area buildings entrances. They were often unlocked and these entrances were also unlocked in the individual stairwells. For those who don't understand what I mean, Many of the stairwells, if not all of the stairwells in Frankfurt, these central areas had three stairwells in each building. Stairwell A, stairwell B, stairwell C. And in each stairwell, there was about six apartments. And sometimes people used the quarters that were at the very top floor too. 
uh, those stairwells are often unlocked. You could just walk right up to the door and open the door and walk in. Now, this is a military housing area with soldiers who live there and their dependent family. They're called dependents in the military for those who might not know. And you have a dependent ID card through the service member. The stairwells were often open. The door you could just walk right into. Was it that way in Darmstadt as well, Lynn? Yeah, as far as I can remember, it was that way. I don't remember them ever locking the stairwell door. Uh, they could have, but I don't remember that. I remember always being able to get in without a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And see, that's from Frankfurt to Darmstadt. Lynn can also attest to that, that the doors were unlocked. Again, with this being a military family that's working for the United States government overseas in an area that was during the Cold War, after World War II, the Cold War, some would say the standoff between America and you and the uh, USSR, how in the world could security and why in the world would security be so lax? Hmm. Number four, housing areas again had very little or no police and or security guard patrol. And in other words, in the housing area were no patrols, no driving around, no military police on foot walking through the area to make sure everything was in order, to make sure there was no quote unquote suspicious activity taking place. There was, I've never seen any of that unless it was a very, very unusual situation, at least in Frankfurt. And what about you in Darmstadt, Lynn? I've never seen any of that either. I, I know that later on when I became a teenager, um, I found out that the general's house and the officer's um, housing area, which was separate, was protected by guards. But at that point, I didn't live in Lincoln Village anymore. I lived, we moved off base but I think even at that point, they didn't have security for the normal housing. They only had security for the higher officers in Darmstadt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, again, there we go from Frankfurt to Darmstadt. And I haven't talked to Lynn before this. So this information that she's sharing with us is very surprising and it's also new information to me too but that just further supports the little things that were jotted down before this uh little show in order to share with the family that just proves our point even more because just think about it if i may just indulge for a moment when you go to malls in the united states when you just go to a mall they have security guards that walk around the mall they have security guards even at the malls as well as Walmart, for example, where security guards drive around the parking lot, walk around the parking lot, making sure things are in order, making sure things are, you know, being attended to, being managed. Why then in a military housing area would this not be something that would be just as normal because of the very valuable military components that we were called, the very valuable military constituents that we were called to our country's foreign policy, which was also important, and that's why we were here, spending billions, by the way. Why in the world would they not just give normal security guards? There was no patrol, and I have to say that I never felt vulnerable. I had a false sense of security. I never felt vulnerable either. And at the moment, I'm trying to think if there were any MPs riding around like at nighttime once in a while. I think once in a while there were police riding around, but. Yeah, every green moon. Yeah. Uh, n not often enough to, to really protect you if it came down to it, you know, but. Um, I felt secure too because I think like I had mentioned 
like I've mentioned before, I had this thing that, well, first of all, I was younger and I just was thinking, I wasn't even thinking about anybody trying to harm us. And if I did know that there were people wanting to harm us, I would think, why? We're American. <laughs> why would they want to harm us? You know, we're the big, we're the big buddies of everybody. Mm -hmm. We help everybody. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, That's yeah. what I would think. Right. Then. Well, that was certainly our uh, indoctrination, I would say, back then. And as teenagers, many of us didn't have, you know, a very good grasp of international affairs. Of course, there was no internet back then. There was no Twitter back then. You know, all these social media platforms to right. heighten your knowledge, your awareness of different ongoings in foreign countries that, you know, that of course our military might be taken part in and therefore, of course, our, govern our government and the military constituents, the active force, right? us, our parents, our, our brothers and sisters. Yeah, so thank you for that, Lynn. Number five, our POVs uh, personally own vehicles for who? For those who may forget what that acronym stands for, POV. Our POVs had license plates that made US military cars stick out like neon lights at night. <laughs> uh, and you know, Lynn, this is because our cars, if you remember back then, and this is uh, around, it's in the 70s, probably even, yeah, I think even into the 80s, the cars had square license plates back then with green, with a green background and black letters and numbers on it, including a USA compressed into the <laughs> license plates. I remember. Emblem or writing. You know, it said USA and it was compressed into the license plate. Right. I remember that. <laughs> this, of course, let everyone know that this was a U.S. military forces registered vehicle. And moreover, the license plates on uh, the German cars of the country were long and rectangular and not short and square like ours. And the Germans had tags with a white background and black letters and numbers, and of course, no USA on it. So then, if we were to be inconspicuous, if the military wanted us to be inconspicuous, right? Then that's how our US military license plates should have looked. It should look more like the Germans, you know, so that we would have blended in with the locals. Yeah, of course. Any thoughts on that, Lynn? Well, it goes back to what I'm saying. I don't think people felt threatened you know, the higher ups didn't think that it was necessary. In fact, for whatever reason that I can't think of at the moment, they wanted people to know that we were American. Right. Because not only the license plate, but like you said, the USA, like right. stamped into it. Exactly. So they So they wanted people to know that this is not a German person driving down the road now. Or a European person. This is an American. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sense to me because actually at those times there were threats. Like you had mentioned, we were in a Cold War, you know. I would have no idea why they, they did that. Yeah. That is why we are here to get people's thoughts on this because, you know, there were options to the way things were done. And when you include into the whole situation of security of the topic of perhaps even false security if you consider that they were always they meaning the military was always talking to us about operation security <laughs> being aware of your surroundings doing what's necessary uh being careful of people who might ask you to sign them into the base and try to maybe give you money you know people from the local economy or whatever Operation security was something that we always heard about, or should I say, I often heard about and often seen broadcast on TV, on radio, from AFN, right. Armed Forces Network, as well as in print publication from right. the military's Stars and Stripes. Stars and Stripes. They were 
always conditioning us and making sure, and I think this was good, to be vigilant, to be aware of security, the necessity for security right. in the community. So mm-hmm. when you throw all that in, this is further more confusing, puzzling yeah. and confusing. Yeah. You know? I think what it is, um, just in a nutshell, is they want us to be safe and want us to look out for our safety. But when it comes to big changes, like maybe making everybody change their license plate or or putting out more uh, guards and patrols, that's all the money factor. So mm-hmm. the things that we can do for ourselves is like like not make us make ourselves stick out when we're downtown or something like that that's something that that you as a person can do and it doesn't really cost you any money but all the things that they could have done for us would have cost them money and more manpower and i'll i'll buy that because right now as you know i have no idea and i wish that i could ask someone that was a former official uh of usura of the united states command in europe and get their input on it but unfortunately i don't have that resource number six our school buses <laughs> our school buses and the dya which was a dependent youth association or the aya for some it was called the aya which was the american youth association or activities youth association i've also seen it I don't know, it might have been something different for you, but when I was in Frankfurt, the DY, it was called the DYA. Yeah, in Darmstadt too. Yeah, in Darmstadt too. Why were the school buses? Why were they a dead giveaway of our status? Because they, the buses, they were big, dark green, very noticeable, very noticeable wheeled like tanks <laughs> driving down the street. They were, they were dark green and of course they didn't have any type of fancy design or or anything like that they looked like they were from like the military and of course they had military usa license plates on the back and they would take us all around on field trips for the dya they would take us uh, those buses would drive us back and forth to school on the highways um you know i am very surprised that with all the travel, for all the different reasons, over about, what, about 50 years of using those buses. Yeah. I am, I, it is a total blessing that nothing ever happened to anyone, that there was no hijacking of the bus or any of that type of nonsense that, you know, we've seen movies about and we've seen, you know, happen in other parts of the world where the civilians on buses were hijacked for ransom or for some oh type of political... Gosh some type of political ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so again, do you have any idea, any thoughts on why the buses were such a, you know, Mm, giveaways? It goes back, (laughs) it kind of is similar with the license plates. It's like they want people to know that here's Americans or here are American kids. I know later on when I went to Frankfurt, hi, I didn't have um, I didn't have to use one of the or green school buses. Our buses just look like a German touring bus, not even a German school bus, but a German touring bus, you know, to go travel. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was cool. And those buses were far more safer for the military kids, for the military students, because they just blended into the local economy. It didn't make it didn't it didn't make the whole travel experience very dangerous in retrospect because the again the bus anybody looking at the bus and not knowing that american kids were on there that were related to american service members here after the cold war they didn't know that they were on there unless you you know unless you had inside information exactly or if you just if you just staked out the bus stops and watched the routine you would know what's going on you know after, yeah, exactly. Just... That's true. That's true. That's another thing. And, and with there being no security for the housing area, you could st- it could have been staked out easily. Anyway, 
<laughs> yeah, this goes deep. Uh, we have about three more here on the Frankfurt Alumni Radio Show. Then I'm so glad that we're doing another broadcast here, and uh, we would like to thank you also for joining us. Um, yes. Before we go into these last three. We're going to slide into another little break here and uh, come back for a wrap. Does that okay. sound good? That sounds great. Frankfurt Alumni Radio, keeping you in touch with your European home, away from home. Well, the Cold War is something that is not talked about very much over here in Germany for many reasons. And uh, every year that goes by and nothing is on television or nothing is in print publication about the Cold War and uh, especially what the United States did in order to free Germany from the dictatorship that was there. And of course, uh, the Fuhrer, the person that was in charge of Germany back in those days, which was the reason that we had to come here along with allied forces to remove him, Adolf Hitler. It often annoys me, just like this four ton, 8,000 pound blockbuster bomb, only 150 meters from the Frankfurt American High School. It annoys me just like that when I don't see any type of commemoration whatsoever in respects of to the lives that were lost in reference to all of the money that was spent and most definitely in reference to being a main catalyst in making sure that this fine country of Germany was maintained by the rightful owners, which were the people and not a dictator yeah so for those who like a little bit of trivia Lynn and I pulled up some information about what happened to Germany after the war after the war Germany was divided into four temporary occupation zones roughly based on the locations of the allied armies the German capital Berlin was also divided into four sectors these are the French sector, the British sector, American sector, and of course, the Soviet sector. And furthermore, a little bit more for you, food for thought wise. <laughs> and I love trivia, by the way. Where Frankfurt is now located in Hessen, 
used to be a part of the American military command, the American military's command here in Germany. The whole Hessen region of the country was under the U.S. military. So that was back in 1945, 1946. Number seven is what we were going to go into right before the music. And this has to do with the entrances and exits for cars and people walking onto the PX compound, the post exchange compound in Frankfurt and other areas. I saw this as well. I'm wondering why these places like the PX compound and maybe the BX, which was the base exchange for the Air Force, why were these places often without security? Security was normally only present as it should have been always after a military security alert, bomb scare, a phoned in terrorist threat, or some other widely publicized political event, which concerned, you know, the U.S. military's central command. Yeah, believe it or not, the PX in Frankfurt, for example, for many, many, many years was without any security to get on the, the base. There were times, as I mentioned, for different reasons that it was secure. They were checking ID cards. They were checking cars for explosives or some other type of uh, assault weapon, like a gun. But that was abnormal. And again, with Operation Security being at the forefront of the minds of the populace, the military populace, why would these places be unsecured? Lynn, do you have any thoughts on that? Well... No, I don't know why they would be unsecured. In fact, I was just thinking as you were speaking, they were more interested in checking your ID card at the PX to make sure you're allowed to get in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than to check if you're even allowed to get in on the base. That's right. So, good uh, point, good point. And I would think maybe they had to do that. Maybe they were obligated by the, by the um, Germans because of a tax situation because German people were not allowed to buy at the PX because you didn't have to pay taxes I think on the on the goods if I remember correctly mm -hmm. and so maybe they were bound by law to have to check ID cards yeah but if you're checking ID cards then at at the PX or BX then you should be checking ID cards at the gate because there were many other things on base that were only for service members, military members, and civilians who worked with the military, and not for Germans, unless they were there as a guest. So they should have been checking everything. Yeah, I agree. And I don't know why they wouldn't have. Yeah, I agree. Number eight, at our high school in Frankfurt, known as... Frankfurt American High School, there was no security force for the school itself. There was no ID checks of the ID card for entering the school, you know, authorized entrance to the school. So just about anyone could have sneaked into the school and caused a tremendous amount of harm to the staff and students. Undeterred. Again, with this being a military school, I'm wondering why there was not anyone roaming the halls or there wasn't a particular checkpoint in order to check IDs. And by the way, it's not like I would like to have had that every morning and stuff like that. Yeah. But I would have understood because I was used to showing my ID card in many places. I would have understood that our school was a military school and only authorized persons should be in there and if you have guests coming then those people have to go and be signed in at the proper office in order to be at the school right there's a consistency here on the insecurity of everything on how things relax i mean you see the you see the pattern 
you know, it was for our school, it was for where we lived, it was for the the compounds themselves where one went shopping or or took care of things. There's a total consistency in the lack of security, you know. And do you think that was on purpose? Or do you think that they just, they, the authorities, uh, the commanders, those who were I think obligated to protect the, the <coughs> military community, do you think that they just didn't realize it? Um, I think they realized it, but they didn't think it was necessary. That's what I think, because once things started happening, then they, then they upped security. And at this point now, you can't even, when you see a, um, a car with American plates, you can't barely tell the difference between, like with the people station in Wiesbaden, for example. You can barely see a difference between the license, the German license plates and the American license plates you now. Mean, yeah, yes, that's so, right. So they've, so they have beefed up security, but something had to happen first before that, before they did that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like um, they were being safe before it was necessary. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They weren't about prevention. We always used to hear about prevention as well. Right. That was one of the biggest advertisements or publicity campaigns that I remember from back in the day on AFN, radio, television, in Stars and Stripes, that word about prevention. Right. Which tied into Operation Security. So that was number eight. And uh, we're going to move on to number nine. Number nine has to do with our U.S. military's also important Crichton Williams Abrams concern. And that was the full name of the concern over here in Frankfurt, Germany. Crichton Williams Abrams. It was named after a famous general. And uh, of course, <laughs> what'd you say? I so, said, okay, I didn't know that actually. Yeah. Um, well, the entrances to the compound were also not police. They were not policed. There were entrances to the compound that were not policed. They were not watched, which were unsecured and, of course, unpatrolled. That is, if you entered the concern by foot, then there was ways to get on the concern unauthorized. One of these entrances uh, was right behind the Frankfurt American High School Eagles school sign. <laughs> and this was this was a main popular one. This one was next to the football field and the track, and the entrance there had stairs and uh, was used every school day and sometimes even on the weekends, like when there were sporting events and you know other numerous activities at the school. So as a result, many students going to and from the neighboring park, because there was a park right next to the school, if you remember, for those who know Frankfurt, for those who were Frankfurt American Eagles, for those <laughs> who were a part of, of uh, the staff there, there was a park right next to the school called Grunberg Park. Right. Grunberg Park. And we put a video up on the channel at, mm -hmm. oh, excuse me, Frankfurt Alumni Video on YouTube, if you'd like to see what the park looks like now. It's a huge, beautiful park. But... Our school was right next to that, and as well as there were students coming from and returning to the four housing areas that were nearby who also used that stair case right behind the Frankfurt Eagle sign. And this used to be unsecured all day long, every day, as far back as I can remember. But um, by the way, the nearby, the nearby housing areas that students and dependents often used uh, as well as military personnel i'm i'm sure those housing areas were high cog plotten um von sturben and hugel housing areas so there was many many people coming through that way coming on the Crichton williams abrams concern and they were coming on there unauthorized well they were authorized because many of them 
had ID cards, but there were also people you can bet that were coming through there onto the compound, onto this also important military compound that had no ID card. Yeah, I'm sure. That didn't have to be signed in by an ID card holder. So again, we were left wide open for something that could have happened, but thankfully didn't. Any thoughts about that, Lynn? Well, the thing too is if... If um, there's nobody standing there checking everybody, even people, German, German, uh, Germans and other people who are not American and not affiliated with the military in any way, they would think it's okay to come on the compound. You know, even if they didn't want to trespass, they would think, oh, well, there's nobody there patrolling, so it must be all right for me to come up here and check things out if I want to. I see. I agree. I you agree. Know? Yeah. I would think that if yeah. I wasn't, and I would be curious. I would probably go take a walk and look around and, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. check out the school or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, not because I want to uh, hurt somebody or something like that. Right. Right. And luckily, again, I can't say that enough, at least <laughs> for myself, mm -hmm. that no one ever got hurt. Yeah, right. You know, um, and that really showed, that really deepens my faith in peace well most people are peaceful i think it's only you know the few that make the problems for everybody yeah that's true those few bad apples so to speak right like the, exactly. like the old saying goes yeah well i think the army security in the community was more relaxed and all you know more relaxed in the air force community but mm -hmm. um with that said i do remember going to Air Force housing areas on the outskirts of Frankfurt, as well as in um, other regions around Germany. And there was no security checks, security patrol, nor were there any fences to prevent unauthorized entry. But again, I, I, I think all in all, Air Force was much better at providing security than the Army. You know, the army was more laid back or maybe it was just confidence, you know, because uh, as you said, Lynn, earlier, Americans are not known to be on the down low. We've always been known, at least over here in Germany, Americans were known. Um, There's no discretion to be. I mm -hmm. mean, and that's not I'm not trying to put fellow Americans or military members down, but only the last years has there been discretion because there's been incidents. Mm -hmm. But before that, there's no discretion. Mm -hmm. Even at the airport where I work, um, you could always, you would always know when the soldiers come in because they'd be in uniform. And only since the incident three or four years ago has that changed because there was an attack on a bus with soldiers on it right at the airport at the airport right and since then they come in now and they're dressed in civilian clothes how exactly but i can still tell because they got their cami backpacks on or stuff like that but it's not it's not um as noticeable as beforehand yeah i think that was what like around 2011 or something like that right something but like see that. it took something something had to happen for 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 people to to be more secure you know yeah they used to talk on the radio on afn like you mentioned earlier about how we have to be safe and one of the things also that they would mention is you should not be an eyesore or a loud american when you're out and about downtown but yet people would ri arrive at the airport in uniform you know and um let that make sense huh yeah so it, it's ironic all the things they expected from us but then when it came down to it they would the military would let their men you know fly and arrive at a civilian airport in uniform and be an eye um not an eyesore but stick out for everybody who wanted to do harm exactly you know and that is totally in line with the reason why we are having this show today while we're chiming in with the family talking about this topic and of course very much encouraging you to leave your opinions about this stuff because well, I just think of nothing else it's just good talk it's it's good radio 
So, would you like to go over the uh, summation? Because we got a little summation of all this, and then the show will be a wrap. We think that most of us military family members had a false sense of security. Yep. And at the same time, an admirable amount of courage, which may possibly have been due to ignorance, like with the live four-ton blockbuster bomb that was recently found, defused, and removed from the former Ab Abrams concern this month. Because in reality, we were very vulnerable and at often times wide open to assault, assault in our cars, on buses, at our schools, schools and at most of our homes in military housing areas. We were all very lucky that at least 90 to 95% of the time, mm -hmm. nothing happened to any of us. Thank you. Although there were many huge security breaches. Yes, there were, and we went over mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Also, it's obvious now that we U.S. military family members weren't being stalked, tracked, or preyed upon by those who wanted to scare us. No, we weren't. Hurt us, nor hate on us. Because, because of, of our freedoms. freedoms and or because of our country's political foreign policies here here nevertheless operation security which was often publicized by the military's afn armed forces network on radio and television as well as by the military's print publication stars, stars and, and stripes, stripes to u.s family members overseas was a great security awareness campaign but in many large respects, Operation Security was being preached by our government and military officials. But in reality, at least here in many parts of Germany, they, for some reason, weren't practicing what they preached. Nope. Which could have been to our tragic demise. Conclusively. And now, in retrospect. Which is often 2020 vision, just like with this live four-ton blockbuster bomb, which was recently found that somehow got overlooked for removal before the large construction began of officers' homes, a large hotel, the Ambassador Arms, for those of you who may remember, soldiers' barracks were also in that location, a very popular movie theater that entertained Thousands upon thousands upon thousands called the Idle Hour, a bowling facility, which I remember being called um, the Hessen Bowl. A very populated high school, and of course the military's Europe European Central Command located at the Abrams Building. To keep it short. We U.S. military family members here in Germany were lucky. Yes. Maybe even divinely looked after. I think so. And obviously very blessed that the large majority of us never got attacked by the all so many threats we were told were out there. Just, just waiting. For an opportunity to harm us. Yep, just waiting for an opportunity to harm us. We heard about that all the time. We were very much uh, told that. I mean, do you remember mm -hmm. that as well? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I didn't always pay attention to it, but I do remember because it. Because it was so much. I mean, they beat it into our heads so much that it was numbing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To that, we would like to say thank you to God. And with that, we'd like to say feel free to leave your experiences in the comments section. And we hope you join us again for our next upload. Frankfurt, American, American. Alumni, Alumni, Radio. Radio.